Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, all right, I'm going to try pressing the go live button. Here we go. Okay. Come on, technology. We are live. Oh, that's really distracting. I can't look at that. Okay. What's wrong? It's the preview was still running in another screen, and so I'm having to oh. watch the uh, the preview, and, and it's like a delayed us. And I don't like it. Uh, so, as always, now we're using a new method. Oh, there we go. Someone has acknowledged our existence, so we are live. Good. Yeah. Hello to... Chris Bamford, Colt Fire, Dustin King, Eric Knapp, Grant Lanning, Guido Bibra, Janelle Duncan, John Suffield, John Victor, K Spence 303, Leonard Clark, Nichols of the Yard, Paranor 001. Oh, I said Paranor 001. <sighs> Sorry, Paranor. It was so cool that I was just, I was already shortening your name. Side MT, Tori, got Tori Gadwa, Uncle Bill Druin, Wayne Johnson. Hey, everyone. Welcome. The Miss Petal, Henrik Bo Anderson. Frank Tippin, Enoch, Tak Tang. Whoa. It's been a while since we've seen Tak Tang's name. Leonard Clark. Ben Kalo. David Reynolds. Did I see? Now you know how to do this. You say hello to me, and then I say your name. Peter Wiff. Zapfin Zapfin. Andre. Don Simmons. <laughs> Simos. Hello, Mr. Fraser. You found the person who makes articles out of your video transcripts? Yeah. <laughs> I loved that. Yeah. That was, you should tell that story because that that had me like snorting and startling the dogs. Yes. Uh, I feel bad for the people who do this because they're coming from a really good place, right? They are I, – I, every couple of weeks I get a comment on one of my videos – that the in this this is the transcript and I will I'll read it out to you and but 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 the gist of this is always the same. Um, let me just find the actual tweet. Okay, here we go. Wow, plagiarize much? This is word for word taken from this website, Universe Today. Not cool. Create your own content. Cite your source if you're taking info from someone and don't regenerate the information that you stole word for word. So. What happened, of course, is someone saw my video on YouTube and then realized that it was word for word an article on Universe Today uh, written by Fraser Kane. And, uh, and I, get, I get accused of plagiarism, uh, like I said, every couple of weeks. Someone is, someone is disappointed, and I'm sure they, they thumbs down my video because I'm a nasty plagiarizer stealing uh, the hard work no. of Fraser Kane. What this tells me is you do not cross promote well enough that everyone knows that Universe Today is Fraser Kane is the guide to space. Yeah, but this is the modern age. Like I'm sure people, there are people who listen to Astronomy Cast that actually have no idea that, that my actual job is to run Universe Today. Even though every week I say I'm the publisher of Universe Today. There are t I'm sure the 160,000 people who follow Universe Today on, on Instagram have no idea about the podcast. Like, we do too many things, and everything is broken up into so many different silos. And either you just spend all your time just trying to cross-promote everything you do, or you just try to entertain people on the platforms that they find themselves on. So... Uh, I, it's true. I, I don't know the solution because literally the video that I created was embedded inside the article. And so they went to the article, the video that they were accusing of plagiarism was embedded into the article. I don't know what to do. Um, but I, but like I said, someone is taking the time to try to fix the injustice of people stealing content. And I got to respect that. So thank you people who incorrectly accuse me of plagiarism for providing transcripts of my videos. Uh, I and thank you, you for providing me with delight. I know the, the internet. I I won Twitter that day because people <laughs> just thought it was so funny. Yeah. Where do you pitch in to and, buy me a those who... a university? I I have one. Look, hold on. Someone someone's asking where do you get a a banner? It's right up there. You just can't see it. Hold on. Right there. University of World Headquarters. But maybe I, it's a thing that I need for my, 
for my I just hold it up I don't know you know what there's no way lower thirds oh. more lower well, thirds. I have a lower third that shows up in my videos it says that I'm the publisher of universe today I it the point is like it's just it it's just not possible it's just there's no way to just it's, anyway it's funny it's funny all right, uh, so if you're wondering what it is that you have stumbled into, this is going to be a live episode of Astronomy Cast. I'm going to ask questions. Pamela is, going to, Pamela is going to give answers, and somehow we will stumble our way to the truth. Then, and, and if I have slimy, glossy eyes that look like I've been ugly crying, it's because I'm still suffering from that scratched cornea. Yeah. And I reached the point of there are not enough eye drops on the planet to oh. make me feel good. So I ointmented my eyes and I'm just going to look like I've been ugly crying. And I'm going to embrace that fact. Yep. And everything is blurry and out of focus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, Um. My beard is getting visibly grayer every week. It's just getting longer this week, and so it's gray on the outsides. You have an ombre beard. It's Yeah, but I'm getting old. This is what happens. Death haunts us all. Um, okay, and then we'll stick around and answer your questions about space and or astronomy. Tell me when you're ready. I am just rearranging my screen, and I am ready. Are you ready? Yeah, I gotta make one edit, then I'll be ready. Okay. Edit done. Okay, here we go. Okay, I'm pressing record. I've also pressed record. We are recording. Astronomy Cast, episode 523, Age and Origins, part two, the solar system. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today, with me as always. Dr. Pamela Gay, Senior Scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the Director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how you doing? I, I'm doing well enough. How well are enough. you yeah, doing? Yeah, I know. You, you still have a scratched cornea. You're, you look like you're sad, but you're really just sad about your scratched cornea. I, I have so much ointment in my eyeballs, <laughs> and I also have an echo. You sure do. Where's the echo coming from? Oh, I see where it's coming from. It's coming from Audacity. I uh, how do I stop this? Are we gonna have to restart the intro? Just keep recording yeah, so you I can fix so. this. Yeah, sorry. Do you wanna start do you wanna start the intro again? Yeah, let okay. me just send this audio somewhere where it can do no harm. Into the you know, okay. headphones? I'm I'm killing I'm killing okay. this one off. Yep, me too. Okay, I'm ready to go again. Me too. Here we go. Recording. Okay, I am also recording. Astronomy Cast, episode 523, Age and Origins, part 2, The Solar System. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how you doing? I, I'm doing well enough. Yeah. How are you doing? Yeah, I know. You are you scratched your cornea and and you are so sad about your scratched cornea. I, 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 I am. It's just healing exceedingly slowly. And I've hit the point where the problem is I have dry eyes and I have so much ointment in my eyes now that... It's like the whole world is a foggy, slimy thing. Yeah. And I'm just going to embrace the slime. So I, I emphasized, of course, that I'm the publisher of Universe Today because I think I broke Twitter uh, on like Wednesday or Thursday by noting that I just got accused again of plagiarizing uh, artic the scripts for my videos uh, from this website, Universe Today, written by Fraser Kane. So um, it's pretty funny that people don't realize that I also write all the, the scripts for the articles and they publish on Universe Today and also on my YouTube channel. It's all just me. Um, but I've got a big piece of news that I want to share. Uh, two more pieces of news. One, uh, I just came back from Calgary. I got a chance to do a big presentation for the Royal Astronomical Society of Calgary and they were wonderful hosts. It was so great uh, to get on an airplane, fly within Canada, not have to go through a border, not spend 12 hours. It was very civilized. 
and I had a great time, and it was really nice to be able to connect with a Canadian audience, which I never get a chance to do. So thank you to uh, to the Royal Astronomical Society Calgary. I had a great time, and uh, I can't wait to come back. And the second thing is tomorrow when we are recording, uh, Saturday, March 23rd, 2019, will be the 20th anniversary of Universe Today. So I will have been doing this job for 20 years. Isn't that, that crazy? That is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it feels weird. It feels weird to be wrapping up 20 years of being a science space journalist. And I'm, I, I'm having so much fun. I can't wait to do another 20, 30, 40 years of this. So, so stay tuned. All right. And, and if you have your robot way, you will be doing this into many more millennia. Yeah, yeah a, few, a few more billion years. All right. Well, today we push our aging curiosity out into the solar system to ask that simple question, how old is it and how do we know? What techniques do astronomers use to age the various objects and regions in the solar system? What techniques? How do we know how old it is? Where do we start? We, we calculate it. Basically, right. I. <laughs> Let's... So, this this is one of those things where, uh, every day you and I get news stories across our desks uh, along the lines of this new star cluster that has been found is predicted to have formed a billion years after the universe was created. This globular cluster over here is remarkably young at only eight billion years, and it becomes one of these. How on earth? do they get at all of these different numbers? Because yeah. it's not like we can go out and grab a sample of star <laughs> and do like we talked about last week and run it through a mass spec and count up the ratio of this isotope to that isotope and get at the date that the star formed. So that's not what we do. We're going to start with that. No, but, but I mean, you know, we were going to try to constrain ourselves to the solar system. Although, as you said, the solar system does include a star. So how do you find out how old the solar system is if you can't sample the star? You can't scoop up a chunk of star and ask it how old it is. So here is where we have to, unlike with trees, where we assume, well, when the tree formed, it had this ratio of carbon atoms. Instead, the process that we use for objects in our solar system and that we use with stars at a certain level, cosmochronography, nucleocosmochronography, relies on us saying, okay, so when this particular isotope set formed, it had this ratio when it formed. And when we look at an object and we're able to get at the amount of those atoms in the thing today, that tells us how long since the atoms formed that that object has been around. Now, the problem with this is it doesn't tell us specifically how long the thing has been around. It tells us how long the atoms have been around. And so this is sort of a first stab at things. In our solar system, we generally assume that everything is the same age as our sun. And so where we start is let's look at the sun using its light, spread that light out as much as possible into a high resolution spectrum, and then do the best we can to count atoms by looking to see how many photons they, absor they absorbed and emitted and from that spectral signature, um, get at it. Uh, it's it's the same thing in a much more complicated form. Yeah, but the, but I guess the the challenge is that if you like here on Earth, right? If you're looking at say a tree, you take that tree, you cut it down, you you measure the amount of carbon fourteen to the nitrogen that it is decaying into and that tells you and you know what it should have been when the tree started forming because it pulled that that atmosphere out of the air and then started the timer but and and to be fair we don't cut down trees and age them that way when we cut them down we just count their tree rings it's a whole lot simpler but when we find 
a piece of wood fine like yeah. a viking shit sure in ice somewhere then everything you said is then true that's what Vikings we do. right made out of wood. i can speak for all canada say that we don't cut down trees um <laughs> everywhere all the time um but uh so but but i you know the challenge is like if i'm imagining a star being the same thing right then i've got some primordial atmosphere which is like obviously the stellar nebula those elements are coming into the star at certain ratios and then those elements are decaying at a set rate over the billions of years. We can't use carbon. We have to use something else like uranium or whatever. But the, in theory, but back to that idea, I can't just, one, how do I know what it should have been in the beginning? And two, I can't just scoop up a chunk of star, separate out the atoms and go, you know, count up the uranium and thorium or whatever it turns into and to know what they are. So how do I know what the initial ratios were supposed to be? Models. And that's the problem with everything not on the surface of our planet when it comes to trying to figure out the age. You have to do models of, okay, you start with the Big Bang. At the end of the Big Bang, you had this amount of hydrogen, this amount of helium, these trace amounts of lithium, beryllium. And then you have a generation of stars. After that generation of stars, what is the ratio of atoms you should have had? Okay, so then you run forward a few more generations of stars. What are the ratios of atoms that you should have had? And it's these models that are giving us a fair amount of error because these models get us at what are the initial ratios of these atoms that should have existed in the star. So with G-type stars like our sun, one of the things that we can do that it is actually one of the best ways for age dating a star is we look at the thorium to neodymium ratio. And this will give us within nine and 14 billion years, the age of an older G-type star. With younger G-type stars, uh, we do have to start looking at things like lead and uranium. Um, when we look at the ratios of these atoms, though, we have to assume that some of that thorium was already there when the star formed. Some of that neobidium was already there when the star was formed. So we use our models to guesstimate what is the base ratio of these atoms that the star would have had when it formed, just given the universe. And then we take a stellar spectrum and you can get at what are the various percentages of the star's atmosphere, which is generally unprocessed. All the nuclear processes are going on in the core for the most part. There are exceptions. Don't at me. We can get at the ratios by looking at how the atmosphere of the star absorbs certain colors of light. And thorium is one of those things that the first time I did high resolution stellar spectroscopy, it became my enemy <laughs> because it has a lot of different lines. Technetium, also my enemy. All of these higher atomic mass elements have line after line after line. And it's by very precisely measuring these lines, knowing that different isotopes will appear slightly different places, measuring the different isotopes very, very carefully. You can do it. I measured magnesium hydride isotopic ratios. I did not enjoy it, but it can be done. Right. Um, by very, very carefully making these measurements, you can start to get at what are the percentages of these different stars in the atmosphere what are the percentages of these different elements in the atmosphere of the star? And by comparing the measured ratios, you can then, starting that sentence over, sorry, Susie, by comparing those measured ratios to the model ratios, that difference tells you how much decay has taken place. And you want to do this with as many different elements as you can. So we look at that thorium to thorium to nuibdium ratio. Don't remove that, Susie. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and in <laughs> G-type stars. Uh, we then start looking at the ratios of different kinds of uranium, specifically the 235 to 238. We then look at the ratio of uranium 238 to thorium 232. Um, all these different ratios it, it they all tell us different things strontium rubidium right. uh led to a seven to uranium 235 these are all pro these are all created in slightly different processes they all have slightly different errors but by putting all of them together you can start to narrow in on what are the ages of things and right. for our solar system we have a sun right there right right but but the well, the thing is, though, is that is that to be off by factors of billions of years is not great. And yet I know that our solar system is 4.54 billion years old. So if that method of dating the sun is so inaccurate, how do we know that number to such level of accuracy? Well, the thing is, if each of these different things is off by a, a fair amount, but there's only a very narrow overlap in, in where all of them mesh up. We use that overlap of all of the errors to say this, this must be where it is. And with our sun, because it's so close, because it's so bright, we can split its light up a bazillion times and get very, very fine grained measurements. And it's from those fine grained measurements that we're able to be more precise with our own sun than we are with anything else. Right. But I guess what I'm driving at is that there's got to be some other method that astronomers have used to figure out how old things are in the solar system that's perhaps raining from the sky, falling on our heads all well, the time. We do use meteorites, yes. And and this starts to get us back to exactly what we talked about last week, which is you take the thing, you pull it apart atom by atom, and you count those atoms to figure out what are the atomic ratios. And here again, you are relying on what do you think the primordial ratios were? What are the present day ratios in that object? Because it's a meteor, we know that it hasn't gone through age processes like a tree has. And this starts to get us at how old do we think the asteroids were, because it's shards of asteroids that are raining on us. How old do we think Mars is, because it's shards of Mars raining on us. And one of the fascinating things about doing this is you correctly get that the moon is a different age from Mars because it did go through kind of a resetting when the moon and the earth evolved out of the proto-earth and Thea Mars-sized object that hit the proto-earth and created a great splash. It's kind of a, a fascinating idea that that if you go back and you look at all of these objects, you look at these meteorites, and they're all, you know, you count up the uranium atoms and you count up the, I don't know what they decay into, I'm going to guess thorium, uh, who knows, something. Um, they You count up the output and then you can say, oh, here's the ratio and you know how long and you, you have a pretty good idea of what the original ratio was. Based on, I guess, seeing enough of these, you can sort of triangulate where that initial data set should be. That you're like, oh, you look at a, you look at a meteorite, you date it, oh, 4.54 billion years old. Find another one, oh, 4.54 billion years old. And yet you bring a rock back from the moon, and it only tells you, oh, 4. I don't know what the number is, 3, 4.4? It's usually 3 point something billion. So it's, and then it is not. And so that, that you know, that something smashed into the earth turned this blob that got remixed up and then started from scratch again, started the timer again, which is this just incredible idea that you can find. And so we would think that if we could find a meteorite that was older than the solar system, for example, that would tell us that it had to have come from outside the solar system. It's, it's, a, it's and, sort of a really amazing technique and, it, and that it's always the same number. 
And the amazing thing about the moon and Mars is we're actually seeing how old are the different rocks. So, so the reason that so many of the moon rocks are appearing to only be 3 billion years old is because that's when the lava that they were made of pro was produced. So we're looking at basaltic rocks that essentially got reset yet again, even though the moon itself is estimated to be more than 4 billion years old. And so when we have trick. lava involved, all bets are off. Yeah, I mean, it's the same trick. You can tell how old lava is here on Earth. You you measure the ratios because it's sort of, it's freshly squeezed out onto the surface of the Earth. And then same thing on the moon. It's going to be freshly squeezed out on the surface of, of the moon. All right, so let's take, let's take two... And we're sort of leading into what is the sort of the next part is actually starting to age and date specific portions of the solar system. So how do we know how old various parts of the moon are? Well, this is where with the moon, we're lucky enough that between the Apollo astronauts and the Soviet landers, we have brought back a lot of space rocks. And these space rocks were gathered from a variety of different sites, and those different sites had different densities of craters on their surface. So when we look at the moon, you can see there are these great dark seas. There are these lighter regolith, we call that, lighter areas that just have their surface beat to expletive with all the craters that appear different rocks from areas with different densities of craters we find have different ages where areas that have the fewest craters have the youngest rocks. Areas with the greatest number of craters have the most rocks. And, and this is because that accumulation of craters on the surface tells us how long that surface has been exposed to the sky. This is sort of like looking outside. And if you see different accumulations of snow in the winter, where that area of your driveway might have two feet of snow if you're having a particularly bad weekend, but there's a rectangle next to it that only has like 10 inches. Well, that rectangle is probably where there was a car. Yeah. Someone moved the car. It's a freshly exposed surface. And that freshly exposed surface has had less time to accumulate snow. Well, with the moon, it's not accumulating snow. It's accumulating craters. <laughs> and different sized craters form at slightly different rates. So the giant craters, luckily, appear at a slower rate. And then smaller and smaller, more and more common. So we can sort of zoom in on how old by going to smaller and smaller craters until we start to saturate. And actually that process isn't useful here on planet Earth because of all the weathering processes that are happening. We can only count a few large craters across the surface of the Earth. The rest are weathered and gone. But on the moon well, and on Mars, they are, they're just there and have been remained there for billions of years. The processes are very slow or even non-existent. And one of the other things that blights our planet, because you can look at Mars and there's plenty of erosion on Mars, but what we have that Mars doesn't is plate tectonics where we are resurfacing our planet by having one plate dive under another such that there are only small bits and pieces of Canada and Western Australia that are truly ancient. And when we go to Mars, we do see areas that are covered in sand dunes that are constantly eroding due to the weather. But these are smaller regions. And in general, we can use craters to get at the ages of different surfaces. And I would imagine that same technique could be used for some of the cryovolcanism that's happening out there across the solar system as well. One of the really awesome things about cryovolcanism that I learned from the series results that have been coming out from the Dawn mission is, and we all know this from looking at photos of like Hawaii, uh, volcanoes slump over time when they're done doing their volcano thing. So when you have an extinct, extinct volcano, it is going to 
slowly slouch back into the earth and over time work its way back towards flat. Well, it turns out that on Ceres, cryovolcanoes are going to do the exact same thing where we can trace the history of volcanism, cryovolcanism on Ceres, we think, by looking at all of these different volcano-shaped mounds that have slumped a variety of different amounts, appearing to say that there's been cryovolcanism over time and it's traced out different patterns across the surface. So what are some places in the solar system that if you could take samples to do some kind of radio, you know, carbon or radio isotopic dating, would you love to get your hands on some samples so that you could then answer some questions about some interesting features in the solar system? Oh, man. So so for me, looking at how different objects have been processed over time, being able to uh, go out and grab samples from asteroids at a whole variety of different distances would get two different things for us. It would tell us when they formed, which hopefully should be about the same time for everything. But it will also tell us what was the ratio of volatiles where stuff formed and the amount of these atoms that like to go from ice to gas instantaneously, these volatiles, uh, their ratios are different at different distances from the sun with fewer volatiles being present inside things that formed near the sun and more volatiles being present further out. I'd love to be able to use volatiles to trace how things moved around after they formed. So this double data on where did things form, what were they formed of, will start to help us answer questions about, well, when did different parts of the solar system solidify? How much did things move around? And how much have they been processed over time? Yeah, I mean, I think about, I mean, the correct answer to that question was everywhere, because yes, um, which like, I do think I said, in a roundabout close, kind of close, on a scientist yeah. kind yeah. of way. But like, imagine, like, if you could take samples of the ice mountains on Pluto, and the ice plains to see when the ammonia glaciers formed, if you could take samples from the, the, the hills on Titan and the sand and the, and the seas of, of ammonia, if you could we could go back and seriously take some samples from the surface of Venus to see when some of those features formed and really understand what shut plate tectonics down on, on that world. It would be incredible. And, and yet each one of those, unfortunately, they're all really rough to get to. And we have to send missions that will get down close and, and dig around in the dirt and do some of this really careful work. And one of the things that we're able to do here on Earth is ice core samples, where we can oh, yeah. look at how old is this glacier versus that glacier by measuring the difference in atmospheric composition that gets trapped in the ice over time. Now imagine going to Pluto and being able to do ice cores to get at the history of all these different areas. Or Europa. Um, Europa, so many different places. Ice cores of the poles of Mars. Yeah. There's so much out there to be learned. If only we had better, low power, low energy requirement, completely sterilized drilling equipment. Right. We have none of those things. No, no. Um, but that would be, and unfortunately, even the plans for sending, say, probes to places like Europa and stuff involve, you know, some kind of uh, nuclear reactor that radiates heat away and melts its way down through the ice, which is not a great way to take, take a nice sample. You want to have a nice clean yeah. drill that pulls up your ice samples one at a time. But so that, so, I mean, literally this entire solar system, like when you think about how busy geologists here on earth and hydrologists as they work with ice cores and water and samples and things like that, there are scientists who would love to get their hands on every nook and cranny of this entire solar system and grind it and drill it and age it and date it and figure out when this, how old this stuff is and to, and to just understand the history and run it all in reverse. And, and the hope starts to be that we'll figure out how to build 
uh, more, I don't know, otter box coated CubeSats for lack of a better way to put it. CubeSats are still fairly fragile, but if we can get them to the point that they can get collided into an asteroid and still come back to Earth healthy, then we can start to imagine sending out small fleets of essentially interplanetary Roombas that go up and grab samples and then fly on home without taking too much damage in the process. We're just not to that point. And as long as we have to rely on SUV sized things that have more mass and thus more momentum to be transferred during a collision, um, yeah, you're better off dropping something lightweight than something heavy. So we need those Roomba spacecraft now, please. Yeah. Please. And so if anyone is concerned that there won't be lots of things to study and discover in the future, uh, it'll never end. All right. Uh, thanks, Pamela. Did you want to do a part three? Are we going to talk about how old things are outside of the Milky Way or... We talked a oh, bit about yeah. stars. Oh, yeah, there is so much cool stuff on yeah. how to age date stars beyond our sun. Yeah, and I think about things like pulsars, white dwarfs, other oh, exoplanets, yeah. and, of course, the cosmic microwave background. So who knows how long this is going to take us. All right. Well, thanks, Pamela. Um, before we Thank leave, you. have you got some names that you want to say? I do. So, as always, we are here thanks to you. Uh, it is your generous contributions that allow us to pay Susie, who keeps us organized, keeps our audio edited, and keeps us in line when we wander off like lost children. So thank you, Susie, and thank you all of you for your generous contributions over on Patreon. I am slowly but surely working our way through our backlog of thank yous. And today I want to give a special thank you to Joss Cunningham, Les Howard, Dana Nori, Kajartan Sveri, Helga Bjorkheim, Bill Hamilton, Frank Tippin, George, or sorry, Greg Thorwald, Richard Riviera, Thomas Sepstrud, Strupp, uh, Corey Doval, Sylvan Westby and Jeff Collins. Thank you all so much. As they say on NPR, we couldn't do this without you. So thank you for donating, well, a cup of coffee a month or more to make us happen. Thank you. All right. We'll see you next week. Bye bye, everyone. I'm waving goodbye to an audience that can't see the way some some can see you well yeah but uh, them them they they need to stick around a little bit longer yeah save uh, grant landing is noting in the chat i just read that boeing starliner just got pushed back till august at the earliest do you hear that starliner not yet but i am so unsurprised <laughs> boeing is uh it's kind in of a bad place. In a bad place right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a. Well, your day was impacted by this, wasn't it? Yeah. So, I mean, it was exactly. So, uh, the flight that I was taking out to Calgary was supposed to be on a um, uh, 737 MAX. 737 MAX. Yeah. And so they had to switch my flight. It ended up being, I went out on a prop plane, which added like an extra 20 minutes to the flight and then coming home i was on a 737 600 so it was still fine yeah. um but uh this you know the these planes are are grounded in canada i know they're grounded in the u.s they're grounded grounded in europe so that's that's they're a problem pretty much grounded globally yeah and then as it relates to space flight they're dealing with issues with the SLS and the sort of severe instability of what's going on with SLS. Uh, now there, that... there was like, <laughs> so for those of you who weren't following, the NASA administrator basically in passing while giving a talk on something else mentioned, yeah, we're considering commercial vehicles for the deep for the deep space gateway, which is like the reason SLS is slated to exist. Well, they were, well, I mean, I think they were, yeah. And for the first trip around the moon, essentially the recreation of Apollo yeah. eight, that that would be on either a Falcon heavy or a Delta heavy. Still using the Orion capsule. Yes. Just... Made it to a so, different rocket. 
and and that was kind of the the thing was keeping orion orion was like orion requires sls apparently no it doesn't but a few days after that announcement suddenly bowen's like no we're gonna hurry boeing boeing is like going 24 7 on this this. and everyone's like what have you been doing for the past decade yeah working Um, on sls yeah. yeah um it's gonna get ugly yeah, I, I like I guarantee that it is about to get really ugly because on the one hand, you've got NASA or Jim Bridenstein making uh, mumblings that they want to land humans on the moon by 2023, no 2025. So now suddenly or even even earlier. So now the rush is on to get humans to the moon and now the hardware is starting to look like it's not ready to carry humans to the moon. And so now there's this new priority and the rocket that was built to do this looks like it's probably not the right machine to do this job. Like it's going to help build the S it's going to help build the lunar gateway. But if the, if the priority is to send humans to the, to the surface of the moon, then you probably want to just go and do what they did with Apollo. So needless to say and and now people are looking at like multi um like orbital docking methodologies so you're going to launch a bunch of pieces of hardware on falcon heavies they'll all dock together and then it'll fly off to the moon and then they'll land on the moon so it's like the the whole underlying purpose for the sls is now in question and at the same time the budget overruns are massive the amount that's been spent on sls is a lot it's going to be a it's going to be a rough time i think over the next year and now the 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 starliner has been Star pushed Hopper. back no the starliner so the the boeing has been pushed oh, back yeah. to to august their manned capsule while the crew dragon just went and 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 starhopper's looking to test yes. there is a fabulous webcam that is being hosted by a surf school six miles away from SpaceX down in Texas. And uh, they have a great view where they can see the star hopper and um, you can just go and get on YouTube and watch what they're doing. Yesterday, folks were able to see them fueling, unfueling. They were going to do a fire test. It got pushed to today sometime. They have a six hour window that they can do it within. So. Um, yeah, it's the kind of thing where we can now use surf school webcams right, to right. Yeah, watch SpaceX. Yeah, and yeah. The, so the thing with the with the Falcon Heavy, for example, is it saves you seven hundred million dollars on your launch costs. So, and a lot of these yeah. spacecraft that were going to be launched on on the SLS, like say the Europa Clipper, could go. You could launch Europa Clipper on. Uh, Falcon Heavy, and then get a second Europa Clipper with your savings, right? So yes. So I think like Elon Musk and the SpaceX team have got to just be looking like geniuses at this point for building a super heavy lift vehicle without a customer and now being yeah. ready and showing up and going, we can do it, we can do it. Now, uh, Falcon Heavy is not human rated. So you wouldn't want to put human beings on the top of it, but that's why Crew Dragon exists. It is human rated. So you, so what does this look like, right? This looks like the original Constellation program back earlier in the decade, where you have yeah. the big, powerful Ares Five rocket, and then you have the the Ares One rocket that just carries the crew. It's human rated. Its only job is to take the meat to orbit, and then you've got the 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 larger, more dangerous crew machine or cargo you machine. You just made them together. And then you made them together and then off you go. And so I think at this point, uh not even, you know, the existence of the Starship notwithstanding, uh Musk has and team uh has always got to give huge props to the rest of the SpaceX team, Gwyn Shotwell and all of them, uh have just thought through the perfect strategy to be ready for this crisis that that the u.s human space exploration effort finds itself in it's more than that it it reminds me a lot of the way we have systematically pioneered things on new media now 
folks like you and I, we are affluent enough that when we see this new tech coming, we can invest the minimum needed to get in on the ground floor. We can buy that microphone. We can buy that camera. So we were there to take advantage of podcasting back before people knew what podcasting was. We were there to take advantage of live streaming when Google Hangouts on Air was the only free kid on the block. And we didn't have to stop and say, someone please read my proposal, approve my proposal, um, say that I'm doing a good thing and grant me a blessing to move forth and podcast or stream or whatever. And and this has been pointed out over the years. Uh, Krelnick had a great description of what you did with the virtual star party as you didn't ask for permission. You just did it because it was the right thing to do. Boeing has been in the been in the asking permission phase for most of its space exploration where they put in a proposal of this is what we're going to do and that locks them into a design plan that locks them into a pathway forward with SpaceX because it's run by a billionaire they also because they're doing the we're just going to launch commercial stuff and bring in money that way also so they're not turning a profit. I'm not saying they're turning a profit. I'm saying that they have sources of revenue that aren't government contracts. Mm -hmm. And you and I both had that moment of, wait, they, they're no longer doing carbon fiber on yeah. the star hopper. They're yeah. now going to shiny steel. He tweeted that they're throwing out yeah. all of their plans. And have and starting you seen, over. like they burned, they burned the boats. Like, have yeah. you seen the dismantled, um, wreckage of their original carbon fiber um, uh, molds, like, and and this like, is that's the thing. crazy. Because what they if this doesn't work? Just... Right? What if they do have to go back to a carbon fiber composite? Too bad. Smashed up all of the the tooling and machining. Like that is madness. I I'm I'm not saying he's not a Howard Hughes follow on. It's not. But the the freedom that they have yeah. to innovate without having the constraints of Congress, yes. of NASA, that gives them the opportunity to say, well, this design we thought was a great idea it turns out to really not be something anyone wants. We're going to start over and do it right based on what we've learned as we went. Yeah. And and and, and I think like people don't even stand a chance. I, like they are gobbling up the launch market now, right? How do you compete against launch prices that low? They reuse their rockets, like yeah. And as you said, they are nimble, and and I think the only crew that stands a chance to really compete is, of course, Blue Origin, <clears throat> which is another billionaire who is the exact same concept and is testing very carefully and is personally funding the development and is and i think their strategy with blue origin they are providing more of the parts to the rest of the yeah. legacy rocket space so they're going to you know they're delivering a um you know the be4 which is this methane driven rocket that could be that could replace say the the rd180 rocket engine which is used by a lot of the uh, like United Launch Alliance, I just I know I'm getting really in the weeds here. I apologize. It's getting pretty wonky. No, it's... Um, but but so you're going to see suddenly, you know, there's there's going to be a big demand to swap out those those Russian built RD180 engines with something American built, and Blue Origin is showing up, and they've got the rockets to be able to do it, and they're going to be able to fund the development of their own work as well. They've got a huge factory. Like we were out at Kennedy Space Center, and you look at the size of the Blue Origin factory; it's gigantic. Yeah. So I you know I wouldn't count them out but they got to move quickly to provide a serious uh competition to to what's happening with with spacex because spacex is now officially running away with all of it yeah and the thing that gets me and and economics and i have a love-hate relationship uh the thing that gets me about watching all of this is it feels like we're at that moment in time where globally we are transitioning from the G8 being nations to the G8 being corporations, where it is the Googles, the Amazons, the Facebooks, 
the consortium of Musk facilities uh, that are the powers to be reckoned with, that uh, they're going to determine our future. And I have such mixed motions about that because I've read too much science fiction. So here is to the actual future, not being the dystopian that so many people like to write about, but um, it is a new commercial future that we're looking at. And uh, all I ask is that people don't claim they've created a new play, a new way to do public transit when all they've really done is recreate the bus using an Uber app. I think I've figured out who disrupts SpaceX and Blue Origin. Who's that? Made in Space. So Made in Space is the company that builds the 3D printer that's attached to the International Space Station. Yeah. They're working on their next round of things like their um, uh, Arc Arconaut, which is going to be this 3D printing drone that extrudes building materials like a spider. Um and just has hoppers of material. So imagine a future where you've got um, like space-based resource gathering, where you've got yeah. 3D printing that is building space-based stuff. And eventually you're building factories, you're building, you're building equipment, heavy equipment, you're building everything in space. What is the need for rockets? Well, the only thing you need and, for the rocket is... is to just carry, again, the meat. Like, if you want and, to go up to space, then get in a rocket and go to space. But the rest of the time, everything is built in space, harvested in space, manufactured in space, deployed in space, moved around in space. It all just happens in space. So, rockets. So, that's that's I've made, that's my uh, that's my recommendation. I am I am bullish on made in space. What like, what I really am waiting for the development of, and they're getting so much better, uh, is experiences that allow you to VR into the realities that we're sending the robots to explore. Yeah. Uh, the other day I, I tweeted about a $3,000 uh, simulator that, that you're essentially planking in where you can fly like Superman through these different environments by shifting your body weight in a well-balanced system. Um, as we get to the point that, they have these multidimensional treadmills. They have all these different things that that allow you to experience VR more realistically. Um, I don't know if we need to send meat into space much anymore. No, I think, I think that's it. If, only if you want to. Like, if you want to go to space yeah. and go to the space hotel, then then you'll want to fly to space. But the rest of the time. It's going to be yeah. robots flying around, building other robots, harvesting resources, moving asteroids, moving comets, and building all of that infrastructure, and then sending us the finished goods as necessary or not even, right? Sending so us... go read the Bobaverse yeah. and Six yeah. Wakes, everyone. What? Six so Wakes? Six Six Wakes by Merle Lafferty. Okay. It okay. takes 3D printing with meat in space in a whole new direction. <laughs> right. Uh Print Crime by Cory Doctorow is a short story in 3D printing. And then Bobiverse is a trilogy. Um, I Am Legion, I Am Bob is mm -hmm. the first book. And it has that whole idea of self-replicating, in this case, advanced. AI is the wrong word, but advanced conscious. Yeah. And, and it's systems and a lot of it is like just getting the people from place to place keeping the people alive and moving them from from place to place against the threats of the universe um, yes I've just wrapped up the second book the dark forest in the um, in the three body problem and now moving on to the third one death's end I think so uh, I think I mentioned this last week second book was so good I loved it and I am i uh, really excited to read the third one. So the first one, it's a bit of a slog. Second one is just wonderful. And so I'm really looking forward to the third one. Although I, I do question the underlying philosophy of the, of the dark forest. So, well, I'm currently doing a reread of the uh, Mistborn series by Brandon Sanderson. Cause sometimes you just need a good fantasy novel set. Um, but 
Yeah. After hearing you talk about the sequels to the three body problem for the past couple of weeks, I yep. think when I'm done with this series, that's going to be the next series that I take back on. Yeah. I've, uh, I've reactivated my uh, Goodreads account and I'm trying to keep track on there of what I'm actually reading right now. I've, uh, that's been my, I wouldn't call it my um, New Year's resolution, but it has been my yeah. resolution resolution to read more. And because they, the, they just pile up. They just keep sending them to me. Like, look at this one. It's the sequel to yep. The Case for Mars by Robert Zubrin. Like the most influential <laughs> book that blew my mind. I want to read it. I don't have time to read. They just keep coming. I Rod get Pyle. it. I get it. Rod Pyle's got Heroes of the Space Age. This is the best I can do for you, Rod. I'm sorry. What else have I got? It has been great watching the number of books in your background increase oh, yeah. in number. This was great. See, I read this book. <laughs> it's upside down. There you go. Yeah. Losing, losing the, the Nobel, Nobel Prize. Prize. And I'm going to be interviewing Brian Keating uh, in a couple of weeks. And that's going to be fun. Excellent. And I'm going to be interviewing Robert Zubrin now that he's got a book out to promote. He'll be mine. So that's the trick. If you want to like interview people, just wait till they publish a book and then you get them. I, I, I mentioned that in Astronomy Cast, like, and a whole bunch of people took me up on the offer when I said, like, I'll, I'll, I'll be interviewed on any show. You just, you just ask me, and I will show up. And so I got, I did like four or five podcasts on totally unrelated to astronomy shows. It was so fun. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. That a photography awesome. show. A, oh, what was it? Like some like industrial, uh, water product show. But they were fans of the show. It was great. It was great. So, okay. Yeah, I highly recommend it. Uh, we saw a couple of questions. Uh, Larry Beckham, I think, wanted to talk about the Chinese. Um, uh, and a couple of other people were mentioning that as well. Like, will the Chinese catch up and and move ahead of of the U.S.? I think... It's, it's a turtle in the hair problem. It depends on if the hair gets distracted. <laughs> right. Um, the, the Chinese are... The, just like number of rockets the chinese launch a ludicrous number of rockets yeah. and right now you know because of the various legal issues and political issues between it they can't do a lot of work for um uh, for the u.s and and other countries but i'm sure if they can get their prices down and they can sort of get themselves to a place where where they're not causing environmental damage, they're not, they're not breaking any of the rules of these other countries. I wouldn't be surprised if if people um, started to shift more work their way. And it's really just a matter of time before they have uh, reusable rockets to the same level as SpaceX. I mean, they are working hard yeah. to copy that technology. It's actually, like, I would love to get more information. Um, uh, there's a really vibrant space reporting astronomy fandom industry in china that is that we have no connection to right there's pro amazing. there is an astronomy cast level show or bigger that we have literally no connection to which makes me sad that yeah that we can't like cross those those language barriers and be able to interact there's some great stuff coming out of brazil huge shows random do you know about the ground control bot for slack ground control no there is a bot that i i did not fully understand how many launches go on oh, every day yeah until annie wilson binary ablaze installed this bot on our slack it's called ground control and it gives you five minute and 24 hour uh launch warnings as well as links to the expected live feed if there's going to be a live feed so i use an app called uh is it called next next space flight on my phone i don't know if it's like too bright maybe it's way too bright but that's okay this down maybe does that work yeah okay so you can see um these are all the upcoming and past launches that are coming up and so i get a i get a notification on my phone when it's about to launch and then i get a notification when it's just launched and so and so it's actually improved my space reporting because i don't have to like think about what's going to be launching i just get these notifications and then i can go okay uh we'll do that so 
So this one I use is called Next Space Flight. So. so if you live in Slack, ground control. If you live on your phone, yeah. Next Flight. Oh, uh, before we go, one last reminder. Someone's mentioning it. Uh, David Reynolds, uh, the Aurora this weekend. Uh, the Aurora activity is off the charts. We should be able to see auroras at really lower latitudes than normal. They're saying New York City, yeah. Idaho. Yeah, you should be able to see them. I should be able to see them. Yeah. So people in, you know, when I think of sort of like Oregon, North, uh, Michigan. So if you're in the northern portion of the of the U.S., try to plan out a dark place that you can go to. Keep an eye on what the aurora activity is doing and spaceweather.com and this is your shot so don't say that we didn't give you the warning now the moon is full which sucks but still it it can be amazing like seeing that aurora with your own eyeballs is there's nothing else like it so so get a chance to do it and uh on that we should wrap it up we didn't answer questions so we just ranted about we did flight. but it was a joyous yeah, rant that was really fun joyous clearly rant. i had to get get a lot off my chest um <laughs> pamela thank you so much thank you everyone watching in the chat thanks to everyone on slack if you want to be a member of this community always go to wshcrew.space they will welcome you and they will put you to work uh and join the the internal chat uh always a pleasure uh, hanging out with you, Pamela, and everybody uh, who's watching the show right now. And we will see you all next week. Bye, everybody. Aww. Goodbye.